God evening to everyone. God bless your heart. We pray God's greatest, richest blessings upon your life, that you are found in health and that you're prosperous in all that you put your hand unto and that your mouth is filled with praise and not filled with worry and contention and bitterness and but it's filled with praise and worship of Almighty God. Best way to come out of any circumstance, any situation in your life is learn how to worship. Don't learn how to complain, backbite, murmur, gossip. Put those things aside. And just learn how to fill your mouth with praise. So if you have your Bible with you, which I hope you really do, I want you to turn with me to a very familiar portion of Scripture, Psalm 24. It's one that you hear me quote quite a bit, just because it just means a lot to me. And I know that if you stop and think about the authority and the power that is behind what this psalm is saying, it will also cause you not only to have your mouth filled with those things, your heart filled with those things, and your action filled with them as well. So we're going to read all 10 verses in Psalm 24, and I'll be reading out of the King James. So if you want to join with me, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell within it. For he has founded it upon the seas and he has established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place. In other words, who's going to come into his presence? He that has clean hands, a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor has he sworn in deceit. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord, and his righteousness is from the God of his salvation. In other words, he's basically saying, hey, you want God to bless you? You want God's hand upon you? Learn to live a clean life before him. Live your life uprightly. Let's continue there in verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. These next verses, 7 through 10, are my favorite. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty in battle is he. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah. Stop and think about those things. Interesting thing about this portion of scripture is the time it was written is the time when the Ark of the Covenant was taken from the house of Obadidim and it was brought into Jerusalem after it had been captured uh, by the Philistines in the days of Elijah. Eli. Eli. If I get his name right, we'll be okay. And the presence of the Ark was very important to the children of Israel because the presence of the Ark of God represented the manifest presence of the Lord. And every time that the children of Israel would go into battle, wherever they would go, they would bring that Ark of His presence there. And as soon as they saw it, they would begin to cheer. They would begin to worship. They would have great courage. And then they begin to fight fight even greater in the place of battle. And as they had their courage, they also had victory in the midst of it all. Uh, there's a scripture that you can look up in a little bit if you want to for Samuel chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, and you'll see how they begin to cheer when that presence came. So David here, writing this psalm, was giving unto you and me some great advice that we need to use in the midst of our battle. Verse 7 through 10. Here it is. Simply this. Trust God. In the face of adversity, we need to just worship. We need to trust 
him. And we know the state of beans in many people's lives today. It's a place of adversity. It's a battle. This is more than just a disease. This is a spiritual battle that is going on. And so when it seems like things are going against you, this isn't the time to become negative. It's not the time to, to speak out these negative things that we have a tendency of doing or thinking negative negatively. It's not a time to be angry and bitter. It's a time to learn how to worship. It's a time to learn to trust God. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. What he's talking about those gates is you and me. You and I need to learn to lift up our heads, learn to worship him, direct our praise and worship to him. And the scripture says the king of glory will come in. Who's the king of glory? He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord who is strong and mighty in battle. Let God do the fighting for you. David in several other portions of scripture basically kind of talks about the same thing in Psalm 5 and verse 3. It says, in the morning will I direct my prayers and I will look up. Learn to get that in your vocabulary. I will look up. And not only in your vocabulary, but also in how you walk through the day. Uh, another portion of scripture, Psalm 121, tells us this. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. For my help comes from the Lord. Jesus quotes it again in Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. Look up. Look up unto the hills from whence cometh your help. The Lord is your help. You see, with this COVID-19 thing that's going on, uh, many people feel like a lot of things have been taken, taken from them, just like with the children of Israel. When the ark of the presence was of the ark of his presence was taken by the Philistines and captured. They felt something great had been taken from them. Let me tell you something great had been taken from them, something much greater than some of the freedoms that we feel like have been taken from us. Um, and rather than to strike out with carnality, to strike out with these um, voices that have anger and bitterness and unforgiveness in it, uh, why don't we fight from the winning side rather than from the side of negativity. Why not do what the psalmist David tells us tells us to do here? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. Who is the King of glory? He's the Lord God Almighty, strong in battle. He is the Lord of hosts. Selah means stop and think, meditate on those very words that you just said. So I just want to encourage you today to stop fighting with the arm of flesh. Start fighting with the spiritual arm, the place where you and I will experience victory. Springboard from a platform of worship and praise and faith rather than moving by our carnal uh, feelings, our emotions, Sure, we're angry, people are upset, things are limiting. But let me tell you something. The world may be trying to limit you in the natural, but the Holy Ghost is still moving, and you are unlimited in the power of God. Use his weaponry. Try putting on the garment of praise. Lift up your heads. Lift up your voices with faith and not negativity and complaining. Listen what Paul instructions to us are in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. And I'm going to be reading this one out of the Message Bible. It says, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. I just absolutely love the way that that says that. If you're serious about being born again, child of Almighty God, full with the Holy Spirit, living with the resurrection power of God, act like it. Don't act like the world. Don't act like everybody else around you. Act like a child of God with the resurrection power of God in you. It says, pursue the things over which Christ presides. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. What the things that Jesus is watching over, pursue those things. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, 
absorbed with the things that are right in front of you. Absorbed with the things that we can't do anything about in the natural. Okay? But it says, do this. This is what you can do. Paul goes on to say this, look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ, where the action is. See, the real action isn't in the world. The real action is around Christ, where he is, in the spiritual realm. See what God is doing. See, the children of Israel, when they were in captivity, and Moses comes along, and he's going to bring deliverance to the children of Israel, the children of Israel kind of got upset with him because all of a sudden now Pharaoh's all mad and he starts taking their straw away from them in order to make bricks. And so they begin to look at the things that were around them, looking to the things that were right in front of them. They were absorbed with the fact that they didn't have any straw. Instead of looking what was going on around them with God, God's deliverance. So they got so absorbed that something had been taken away from them instead of being absorbed with what God was just about ready to give to them. Get absorbed with the things where Christ is superseding over, what he is reigning over. Start participating in the spiritual aspect of it on the positive side that is going to bring you to a place of victory rather than being self-absorbed and world-absorbed, negativity-absorbed. Get your spirit man absorbed with the Spirit of God and start worshiping and giving God praise. And Paul ends this thing out in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2 out of the message, this is the last statement that he makes. He says, see, see things from God's perspective. It's one thing to be able to see it from the CNN perspective, CBS perspective, Fox perspective, whatever news source that you're getting it from. But God has a better news for you to see it from. See it from God's perspective. God has a plan. If we will just start seeing it from God's perspective and learn to lift up our heads and allow for the King of glory to come in, you'll walk in that victory. I found this very uh, good illustration that was taken from a sociologist that accompanied a group of mountain climbers on a specific expedition that they were going on. And so it says there that one of the things that he observed was a distinct correlation between cloud covering and people being content. When there was no cloud cover and the peak, the place where they were climbing to, could come into view, the climbers became extremely energetic and they became extremely cooperative. But when the clouds rolled in and blocked the view of the mountain peak where they were climbing to, the people became very sullen and they also became very selfish. Selfishness is self-absorption, isn't it? You're only concerned about you. And so the same thing, I believe that's a great picture of the things that happen with us on our journey that we're on right now from the time we're born to the time we get to go home to be with the Lord, is that as long as we look up, as long as we lift up our heads, and as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, attitudes change. There becomes a bounce in our step. There becomes joy in our voice, in our, in our whole outlook. Our attitudes become good. The rotten ones go out the window. The attitudes become good good. But as long as we keep looking down, all we see is the dirt beneath our feet. And when we do that, then we start to grumble. The carnal man comes out. We complain. We come bitter. And every time that we have to kick some kind of dirt clod, something that would be an obstacle or a rock that's in our way, what happens? 
is that we become very negative. We don't get our way. We become crybabies, if we want to say it that way. But as long as we look up, like these mountain climbers, they kept seeing the peak. Man, their whole attitude changed. They cooperated with one another. They helped one another. They were in a positive type of an attitude. But as soon as they could no longer see the top of that mountain, they become very self-absorbed. Listen, our life in Christ is not about self-absorption. It's about losing our life that we might gain his life. Or I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for me. No longer self-absorbed. My life, I pray, reflects Jesus. Sometimes I look down, lose sight of the mountaintop, but I come back. Psalm 24, look up. Look up. Lift your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up. Glory to God. So Paul's encouragement to me is my encouragement to you. Keep your mind Christ-centric. David says it in another way. He says this in Psalm 34 in verse 3. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. See, when you and I look at certain things one way, it always determines how it affects you. It'll affect you internally as well as it will externally. <clears throat> because how you absorb things, how you see things, and it, how it affects you on the inside will always affect you with your actions and your motives how you speak, how you react, all of those things. David's answer for that is this. Worship, oh, magnify the Lord with me. and Let us exalt his name together in every aspect. You see, magnifying God doesn't make God any bigger than he already is. You can't make God any bigger than he is. But when you magnify the Lord, what it does is it changes your perspective of God, how you see God how you perceive God, and how you perceive God and your perspective of God changes how you perceive the circumstances around you. Your perspective of that changes. How do we enlarge God? Easy. How do we magnify him, if we can say it that way? How we get a better understanding of God. Enlarge your understanding of him. Get in the Word. Find out who God is. Find out what God says about certain things. Remove your opinion and your feelings and your emotions about it out of the way and find out how God thinks about these things, what he says about these things. Enlarge your understanding of him. Well, great ways to do that, not only by the Word, but by praise, by, by worship, submission of your life to him. Taking our minds off of ourselves and setting them, setting our minds upon him. Place the whole emphasis of your day upon God, upon Jesus, upon the Holy Spirit, upon the word. Enlarge our perception of God. David did this when he went to battle against Goliath. You see, the children of Israel had a different perspective than David had. The children of Israel did this. They placed themselves next to Goliath. Hmm. How little did they seem next to this gigantic individual? I forget how tall and how big and how heavy and all of those kind of things, but the, the scripture tells us what they are. All I know is that everybody looked like an ant to Goliath. He was huge, powerful, and strong, roared with a loud voice. And so when the children of Israel, the armies of Israel, they set themselves next to Goliath, they looked at it as a totally impossible situation. But now watch what David did. David 
set Goliath next to God. Huh. Hmm. Now look at the perspective. How small did that giant look while he was next to God? He looked minuscule, microscopic, probably. No wonder David could just take a rock and just beat him in the head and kill him. Hmm. You see, that's the way God wants us to look at everything around us. Put God next to COVID. Put God next to your finances. God, put God next to your sickness. Put God next to your family. Put God next to every situation that you have. And you see how small those things are and how big God is. And then you'll lift up your heads or your gates. You'll see that the King of Glory will come in and victory will belong unto you. Glory to God. Mark chapter 4. Go with me. There's another story here. I, you you got to see because it's kind of in the same realm of where the children of Israel were. Because here's a circumstance that seemed like it was going to overcome uh, the disciples. And <clears throat> just like with the stuff that's going on around us today seems like everything wants to overcome you, but it won't. God is bigger than it all. Look at Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. It says this, In the same day when the evening was upon them, Jesus said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as it was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that now it was full up with water. And as he, Jesus, was in the back part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said unto him, Master, do you not care that we're going to die? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you don't have any faith? <laughs> Good question. Now, put yourself in this story. We're going to say that it's you in the boat. Not just the disciples. It's just you in the boat. Me in the boat. Whoever. Okay? <clears throat> and the boat that you're in is this very nicely built boat. It's super sturdy. But the problem with, no matter how big the boat was or how well it was boat built, it really is not much of a match for 10-foot waves and howling winds. So you just picture this thing just rising up out of the water and plunging back down again and coming up and going back down. And then not only is it doing this straight up and down thing, but back down, nose first again, feels like it's going to kind of tip over. And then the force of the waves is now beating on it. It also has all of the wind that is contrary to these people as well. So you and everybody else on board now have panic on their face. <laughs> Rightly so. I would say. I mean, I wouldn't like it. I'm not much for the ocean to begin with, but <laughs> in a little boat that has no motor on it, it's got no radio on it, <laughs> got no radar on it. And I know that the Coast Guard didn't exist during those days. So here they are in a pretty precarious situation. So these everybody now they're grabbing onto that mast in the center of the boat. And I'm telling you what, they have a death grip on that. You do too. And there, right in the middle of them, you hear, you hear all that wind howling. You're hearing the sea beating against the side of that boat. And so out of all of that, you're hearing some kind of noise in the midst of all of that. You're hearing somebody snore. 
You're waiting to hear some words of encouragement. You're hearing, waiting to hear some words that's going to say, hey, everything is going to be okay, guys. Just hang on. This is just a temporary thing. No, don't hear that at all. Not hearing anybody trying to dispel their fear at all. The only thing they're hearing is a snore. And as they're looking around, you're looking around with everybody else, and you say, hey, wait a minute. Somebody else is supposed to be on board here. And they're not here up on top of the deck with us. Where did he go? That person was Jesus. <laughs> and uh, all they're doing now is they're looking, they're trying to find him as they're holding on to this. They're waiting for some kinds of words. And they they follow the sound of the snoring and they see Jesus curled up in the back of the boat with his sleeping bag and his pillow and his teddy bear going night night in the of the storm and so you begin to start scratching your head you get into wonderment and say hey doesn't he even care don't you care whether we drown do you not care whether we die isn't that the question that they asked him don't you care don't you care that we're going to perish in all the midst of this <laughs> and the thing is is that Jesus' perspective of a storm is different than our perspective of a storm. <laughs> Jesus saw it as a spring shower on a calm day. <laughs> and the thing is, is that Jesus has been around long enough to know that everything that comes will soon pass as well. And so <clears throat> the thing that causes us to be fearful and to strike out negativity, carnality, causes us to walk around without faith, but we walk in fear. And all of that, Jesus just walks in peace because he knows this. These things are only temporary. And there is something that we need to do and learn how to walk through the midst of it. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, ye everlasting door. Let the King of glory come in. What happened when the King of glory came in the midst of this storm? He spoke to it. His word speaks to a storm and brings calm. Jesus didn't wake up all panicked and go, oh, we're in the middle of a storm? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, well, the, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? No, first thing he did, he just stood up. And what did he say to them? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? What causes us to be fearful and walk in a place of doubt? Jesus didn't say, um, where'd your faith go? He says, how is it you have no faith? There's a big difference there. So you and I need to have faith in the middle of every storm, knowing full well that God has everything in control, that God's word will prevail over every storm in your life. Jesus simply took charge of that storm. He got up, rebuked the wind, spoke to the sea, and there was a great calm. How could Jesus sleep in the middle of the storm? Because you can only sleep through a storm that you have authority over. Listen, no matter what the storm is that is around you, if you get in the Word, you learn how to worship. You learn how to lift up your head. You learn to look to the one who has the answer. Listen, whenever that storm comes, you will know full well that you have authority over that storm and you let be at perfect peace like Jesus was in this particular boat. You'll be like David when he faced that Goliath, when he faced that giant. David was able to put things in proper perspective by putting those things next to God, by magnifying God, changing your perspective. You and I will come through everything that is going on. We just need to be patient. Wait on God. Stop acting in an area of carnality, bitterness, anger, those things will never get anything done. They just That's what's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to speak like that. He wants you to act like that. 
But God has something bigger and better for us in store. It says, the trying of our faith works patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that we will be complete and entire, wanting nothing. So the thing is, is that if we'll patiently stand in faith during this entire time, you watch how God is going to bring us through bigger and better on the other side. God cares about every storm in your life. And believe it or not, he's still in charge. See, just like the climbers who couldn't see the peak because of the, <clears throat> the clouds and the things that were around them, how they became sullen and how they become selfish. Those fishermen in that boat lost sight of the shore and the, all they saw was a storm and all they did was panic. Hmm. Don't lose sight of the shore. Don't lose sight of the mountaintop. Don't lose sight of Jesus. Don't lose sight of the Father. Don't lose sight of the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't lose sight of the word of the living God. Don't lose sight of the promises that God has for you. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting door. Let the King of glory come in. The King of glory, this is who he is. He's strong, he's mighty. In battle is he. Declare his authority. Declare who he is. Magnify him. Remember that boat ride? One that you really weren't on, but sometimes you are. But the disciples were on that boat ride. And two, and they were all fearful. Not one of them were without fear. Everybody was kind of in the same boat, as we might say. But listen what two of those fishermen on that boat later had to say and how they came through with power and might and how they make a bold declaration on how to declare the authority of God in every circumstance. John, John the Beloved in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. <laughs> you hear that? One of those fishermen that Asked Jesus if he didn't care. The one that was grabbing onto the mast had his fingernails dug deep into that wooden mast, holding on for dear life in fear over a storm, now boldly stands up and makes a declaration that says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And in another verse, he says this, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Walk in faith, you'll overcome the world. Peter, there's the guy. Brave, not so much in so many places. Runs away, denying Jesus. There on the boat, fearful, right beside John, hanging onto that mast, thinking that he was going to perish. Says these words in First Peter chapter three and verse twenty-two: Jesus is gone into heaven and is at the at God's right hand, ruling over angels, authorities, and power. What does that have to do with us being fearful? You are in Christ Jesus. The Bible said that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you are in him, you are reigning and ruling over those angels, authorities, and powers. You're ruling over them. The scripture declares unto us that he put all things under his feet. If they're under his feet, they're under our feet as well. See, it's only right that those two fishermen declared the authority of God. And equally, it is only right that you and I will do the same thing. And in the face of adversity, I encourage you, worship. I encourage you to declare the authority of God, to stop grumbling, stop pouting, and start shouting. Glory to God. Give God the glory and rejoice in victory. And most importantly, Worship the victor, Jesus. Worship him.
We just pray, believe God, that you're going to start changing your perspective of things that are around you and begin magnifying God in a greater and a mightier way. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask you right now, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to apply eye salve to every eyeball, <laughs> every ear cause them to be opened so that they can see you with greater vision and hear you with greater clarity. Give them a heart of courage to be able to stand in the midst of it all without succumbing to carnal acts, but they will begin to lift up their heads. And as they lift them up and they begin to worship you, they see the Lord God Almighty coming in with a greater victory. And they have that victory in this world, Father. They walk in power and authority of the kingdom of God. Anoint them with fresh oil today, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless your heart. Let you know Nancy and I are still continually to pray for you on a continual basis. Every day we lift you before the Lord. We're believing God that you are strengthened in your spirit, man, and that you are walking in health all the days of your life, that whatever you put your hand unto, that you prosper in. The angel of the Lord are camped around about you, and that you are blessed when you come in, and you're blessed when you go out. You're blessed when you lay down. You're blessed when you rise up again. We ask God to anoint you fresh oil, and that there is more than enough in your household at this time. And that people see the glory of God in your life. And that you are a glory and a praise and an honor. And that as uh, Isaiah says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. God bless you. We thank you for your continual financial support as well as your prayerful support and how you encourage us all the time. We really appreciate your words of encouragement, your cards of encouragement, and your prayers that come forth. And believe me, one day we're all going to be back together, lifting up holy hands together in the house of the Lord. But in, in the meantime, continue to lift up your hands, lift up your head, lift up your voice, declare the glory of God, be a praise and a glory and an honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God bless.